Hello, are we live now? Adnan, Amber? Yes, we are, we are live. We will wait a few minutes and then let the participants join. Yaku, floor is yours. You can start now. Fawad will start. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good evening, everyone. Shuru karte hai Allah ke naam se. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kul wallahu ahad. Allahu samad. Lam yalit. Walam yulat. Walam yakullahu. Kufuun ahad. Uh, today, uh, another series of webinar. My name is Fawad Afraq. I'm a member of the PAID committee. Uh, and the CPD committee of ICAP, which is uh, involved in conducting various webinars post-COVID and uh, uh, various webinars on the industries. We have done uh, an earlier webinar on oil and gas sector on the upstream. Today, we are doing a webinar on the downstream sector. Uh, today's webinar, as we all know, that oil and oil sector is a major sector globally. Uh, global impacts, uh, COVID, has had a severe impact on, on this sector. Uh, it is the backbone of most of the economies globally. And, and it would be interesting now as we are going into the recovery phase, uh, COVID hopefully is, uh, is, has come to its tail end, a vaccine coming in probably soon. So we are now moving towards the recovery stage. So it, is, it would be interesting to hear from the global, from the leaders, local leaders, their perspectives, international perspective, as, a, as well as local perspective on, on the industry. How is it is shaping? What are the challenges it is facing? Uh, before I move further uh, and talk further, firstly, I would like to call Ms. Formally, ask Mr. Khalilullah Sheikh to welcome all the panelists, and then I will take it from there. Mr. Khalil. Hey, thank you for that. And a uh, warm welcome to all the participants in today's webinar. A gratitude to all our distinguished panelists and our moderator, uh, Harun Saab, Adil Saab, Sharyar Saab. Thank you for joining the webinar, sparing time out of your busy schedules. And our very dear Yakub Saab for moderating today's. Thank you so much. Uh, Oil, as Fawad rightly said, is, we all know, one of the most important sectors. This sector drives and energizes many other sectors of our economy. Uh, so it has its significance we call globally, locally. But it, there are interesting times for this sector as well. We keep uh, reading different reports, different technology and other trends are impacting this. I distinctly remember on a Stanford report that I read probably a year or so back. We talked about the impact of these renewables, the cars, and it was a report about the technology's impacts, including 3D printers and all. So on the oil, it, it, I distinctly remember one phrase. It said the oil economies in a couple of decades are heading towards the destiny of dinosaur because of the renewables, the electrical power, the trends. To what extent this impact has been realized globally and locally, we have a galaxy of speakers to enrich us about it. And similarly, we see, I mean, heavy volatility in oil prices. The COVID, of course, has its own disruptions on both demand and supply side. Uh, being in aviation and this fuel being one of our important sectors, so we have to continue to watch it. I recall in January when there was a US and Iran step off. So I was speaking to Standard Chartered London and talking about oil hedging at that time to hedge against the upward trend. And then a few months later, the oil dipped and we were all trying to hash the lowest levels, right? So it's an interesting time in this sector and like all of you, I'm, I'm really looking forward to listening the expert views of, of enriching ourselves of what's happening in this, in this sector, how these trends are impacting them. So with this, I won't take much time for WhatsApp 
over to you and again a very warm welcome to all the participants uh, thank you very much khalil for your uh, warm welcome to everyone your continuous support and advice has been instrumental in uh, making these successful webinars across different industries. Uh, moving to the uh, uh, oil and gas sector webinar, uh, we are quite honored today that we have a very august panel which ha who have agreed to join us. Uh, and uh, let me take a few minutes before I hand over uh, the mic to the moder moderator. Uh, we are joined today by Mr. Adil Khattak, uh, who is the CEO of uh, Atak Refinery. Uh, Adil, Mr. Adil Khattak has a 44 plus years experience of the oil sector, amazing. And Mr. Adil Khattak is a, an engineer by profession. He is a, a, on the board of directors of uh, Atak, uh, uh, many other organizations uh, of Atak, Atak Hospital, Atak uh, Power Gen. And he is also on the board uh, of uh, several institutes as well as on the board of governors of uh, LAMS and, and other GIK and other institutes and a lot of social services that he does. So we are honored to have you here, sir, with us today speaking to our professionals. Uh, on the panel, we also have Mr. Harun Rashid, uh, another amazing, he's the country head and uh, managing director of Shell. Uh, 25 plus years of experience. He started his career. He did his MBA from uh, uh, LAMPS uh, and he joined in 1995. He joined Shell. Uh, in 2001, he did his MBA from uh, INSEED and he carries a, a, a working experience internationally. He's worked in Singapore, he's worked in Pakistan, he's worked in Europe and uh, in Shell. And he has a lot of experience in oil marketing. Uh, and the distribution and related businesses. Again, we and we have uh, uh, welcome Mr. Harun Rashid and thank you for honoring us today. Uh, we have with us Mr. Sheria Rumar, uh, who works for a, one of the largest oil refineries and a, and a local household name, PSO. Uh, Mr. Harun Rashid is a global, truly a global professional. He has worked in 17 in seven countries globally in two continents. He's worked with major uh, brands. He's worked with Coca-Cola, he's worked with Citibank, he's worked with Maggie, and there are a lot of other things that he, he has to his name and his credit. He has been involved in major retail distribution networks and setting up different marketing and other challenges globally. Uh, in fact, handling PSO 3,500 retail outlets uh, and managing, managing the product is itself a big challenge. We are honored to have Mr. Sheriyar Umar with us on board. Uh, this entire August panel will be moderated by our industry veteran and our pride, Mr. Yaqub Sattar. Mr. Yaqub Sattar, another 30 years plus of experience, uh, started his career in 1981 with Ferguson, went to Saudi Arabia, worked for a very large company over there, joined Engro, worked there for 17 years, and after that, he spent 15 years at PSO working in different leadership positions, and um, uh, he was a, he was a board member of various its associates and subsidiaries. So this is this is the this is the panel that we have today, and we are very lucky that we will be hearing from them the views on the oil and the challenges over there. Before I hand over uh, the mic to Mr. Yaqub Sattar, just a brief on 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 the internet and some housekeeping issues that Mr. Yaqub Sata will be moderating. In case he gets disconnected, I will be taking over and I will be conducting till he joins back in. Uh, if any panelist gets disconnected, we will move, we will go to the next uh, panelist for the question. And when the, when the panel, panelist rejoins and at that time, uh, we will again engage uh, on the questions with the, with the panel who got disconnected. We will have a question answer session. Initial, there will be initial round of one hour, then we will have a, uh, have a question answer se session. There will be audience poll which will be run, which will run in between. And we encourage all the panelists and the audience to participate in that, uh, which will be very interactive. Any question answers, please use the question answer booth. Uh, that would help us in collecting the messages post. Uh, one last thing, uh, after the webinar, we also uh, uh, run a paper on this webinar. Uh, a document which is uh, which carries all the comments of, of the panelists and any question answer that is left unanswered we try to cover in that 
thank you very much and yakub satar sahab over to you uh, thank you very much uh, fawad uh, thank you very much icap for organize, organizing this wonderful uh, webinar and thank you khalil for your introductory remarks uh, khalid rahman sahab uh, the, the chairman of the pib committee and fawad who is looking after this webinar and i'm sure uh, with a lot of support from amber from icap uh, we had an interesting session uh, a few uh, weeks ago and that was on the exploration business and it was a very very exciting session so we started off from the top where the crude oil is ex extracted by these organizations and we also discussed a lot about lng the last time because that is also some a product which is coming today we are moving ahead now we are looking at the downstream business which covers the refineries and the oil marketing companies and again a very very exciting area i think more energy and a lot of work and uh, the maximum activity takes place in these two areas in the entire industry chain now the oil industry as we all know uh, is really going through a very very difficult phase we used to see fortune 500 companies list and the oil majors used to be there exxon mobil chevron shell and all these people and all these companies now when we look at the fortune 500 they are not there they have gone down many many paces and things are changing so this shows the world is changing what's happening i mean uh, this covid thing has further created a lot of issues for us now uh, the profitability of the organizations are severely under pressure and i am sure uh, all three adil saab harun and uh, sheryar they would agree with me that uh, keeping profits in place for organizations in the oil business is a very very major challenge these days this year covid has really wiped out uh, many many economies uh, your europe is in recession our neighbor india is uh, almost in recession now uh, extremely uh, difficult situations further we have seen a rapid growth in the renewables now renewable again directly competes with the fossil fuel and we have seen many countries giving deadlines that okay from the, the, this particular year we will totally eliminate the consumption of fossil fuel so all these things uh, you know uh, are having an impact on the profitability of the uh, oil majors and uh, oil organizations so what do we do now so the, the covid experience showed us that only those companies which relied on technology could manage to survive and even today when you see uh, the session that we are having is an alternate uh, technology use that icap has taken over is using to remain engaged with all the members had we not used it we would be sitting and waiting for when the good times come but no Uh, all uh, forward looking organizations are now relying on technology and every organization is innovating trying to in their board rooms the only discussion goes on is to how to survive how to move forward and how they are looking forward and that's why we have a very distinguished panel today and i'll go one by one with the panel i'll first uh, request harun to come in then i'll call in uh, adil saab and then uh, sheryar so that we learn from them exactly what are the challenges you are facing in your organizations and the industry is facing from your point of view what are the trends which are reshaping the oil industry because that's the topic of today if there is a, a disruption somewhere then people have to reshape re relook and restrategize and how does the future energy company look like because the advent of uh, technology and the uh, alternate energy is really knocking at the door with such uh, which are cheaply available so uh, harun uh, i'll request you to go first uh, try to uh, time your uh, sessions uh, individually at 8 uh, minutes and i'll remind you when those 8 minutes are over thank you very much so harun we start off from thank you uh, thank you uh, yakub bhai the, the questions that you ask you know you can talk about them for hours and hours yeah. <laughs> i will try to be very brief the first one that you ask is what are the biggest challenges your company and industry is facing in 2020 and beyond so i will start with industry then come down to 
company and in company the shell group in uh, downstream and shell pakistan limited so i'll talk about both so let let, let me start with the industries the oil and gas industry is facing what we see or what we call an energy transition surely two things are going to happen one is there will be a peak oil demand whether it is in 2030 whether it is in 2025 or it has already happened that i don't know but i can reasonably tell you that if i look at all the different estimates out there you know saudi aramco normally publishes the most optimistic estimate when it comes to energy growth even saudi aramco says somewhere in 2030s oil and gas demand will peak there are others bp recently said oil demand has already peaked covid was a you know a a a key milestone that kind of made us realize that and then there are many in the middle so what does that mean what it means is that the, if if the demand of oil and gas is going to peak in the next 10 15 years it will be you know energy consumption in the world is going to continue and probably increase so that bit of energy which will is now being provided by oil and gas will be provided by renewables solar hydrogen electric etc 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 the renewable side is a fast changing space so i will not comment too much on that side because our, you are talking about our industry and how it is changing but it does mean that the impact on our industry is very very significant it starts with the oil price because obviously as the oil price goes down uh, you know less people invest in oil but the problem with that is as less people invest somewhere during the transition you can reach a critical stage where oil price shoots up again because oil demand is not going to go down to zero right all we are saying is today the demand is 95 or 96 million barrels a day it has peaked slowly it starts to go down when do, when do we reach the peak we don't quite know but slowly it starts to go down if on the other hand production drops suddenly oil price starts to hit the roof again and one thing i can reasonably say is oil price is going to be a lot more volatile moving forward than it is today that volatility in oil price if i may is going to result in a big impact on pakistan what do i mean every 10 dollar movement in oil price you know because we are a relatively oil is a relatively inelastic demand oil and gas every 10 dollar movement in oil price affects our budget by roughly 2 billion dollars as a country that's a, that's a high level number uh, and you know if if oil price goes up by 10 Uh, by ten dollars uh, uh, a barrel, uh, then you know our country has to import the same oil for twenty uh, for two billion dollars more, and that's significant, right? Uh, and you know you, you you're clearly seeing a world where there will be more volatility. Now, what does it mean for our industry in Pakistan? It means many things. Number one. Uh, Adil Sahab will talk more about uh, refining, but I can say that refining capacity is going to be in the region. You are going to have excess refining capacity. You already have it. There will be closures, and we are already seeing some of them. Estimates vary by analyst, uh, but you know those closures will be between zero and five million barrels a day of capacity that will be taken out in the next three four years. Europe will be the most affected place. or that's my kind of uh, insight uh, but, uh, because asia still there's demand growth but what does it mean for our companies in pakistan what it means is and adil sahab can talk more about it is refining margin is going to remain compressed uh, because our oil price or our import price is determining the refining margin in a way it also means that if oil price remains low then demand for oil products in pakistan at least in the next 2 3 years will increase because we are a young country you know our our people are young uh our motorcycle car park growth is explosive 
uh, you know, our economy needs more oil, more gas, till we make that transition to renewables. So that is the second thing it means, uh, which is a relatively low oil price will mean more demand in the near term. That does not mean Pakistan will not be a part, have its own energy transition, Pakistan will. And it will mean more volatile prices. What does more volatility mean? More volatility means that for the oil companies, now marketing companies, there will be periods of high income and there will be periods of negative income. And you know, a company's capability to supply the market consecutively and for the government's capability to allow a reasonably fair structure so that people do not take advantage of it is absolutely key. Otherwise, companies like Shell, PSO, we will be at the losing end. And therefore, you know, our, 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 our governance structure in the country needs to be very proper. These are, you know, in a way, trends that are shaping the industry in Pakistan. And, uh, you know, so then I asked myself, uh, the future energy company, that's a very, very important question. And uh, I believe I'm now in the last two, three minutes, sir, so I will uh, try to wrap up. Uh, so, you know, for our local companies, refining margins low, clear expectation of higher demand uh, on the oil and gas side, clear expectation of volatility, for volatility to work, rules need to be the same for everyone. Rules need to be applied in a consistent way for everyone to play evenly. Uh, um, but, you know, a growth market, nevertheless, and a very important market uh, for the oil markets uh, across the world, Pakistan is and will become. Then, you know, what, what will the future energy company look like? To me, you know, if I kind of take a reflection back and go much back a hundred years, our, 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 what was the oil and gas industry then? It was competing against electricity then. Uh, you know, Tesla was a company then that was competing against Exxon uh, for uh, AC current, DC current, and how do you energize New York? There's a whole documentary on it huh? because uh, uh, Exxon was saying uh, it needs to be energized through uh, kerosene because that is how it was energized. Uh, you know, that's how lights were lit. And, uh, you know, uh, the DC current was coming in and, uh, you know, there were companies saying, no, 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 there's, an, there's another technology. You can generate electricity differently. A big tussle and a big war was fought out. Today, the same thing is happening in a different context. You know, the world wants cleaner, greener energy. So the future energy company, in my humble opinion, will be one that realizes that there is an energy transition which realizes that, you know, I have to change how I provide energy to the world. I have to work with the government in whichever country I choose to work in uh, and with the private sector to provide energy in a meaningful way to my consumers who are today buying oil, gas, tomorrow they might want electricity or they might want a cell or they might want a battery and the future energy company will be one that is on the leading edge of technology. It realizes, it will realize that there is a large technology play as the energy transition happens because the energy transition can go in many different ways. And those with the best technology, those with the best uh, ideas, those with the best capability to implement that technology in a safe, cost-efficient way will win. The future energy company will have a big component of R&D about it. The future energy company will have a big component of understanding how is the world changing? How do I play this changed world? What are the new products I bring in? How do I integrate technologies? How do I create that into something meaningful for my customers? You know, for me, a very telling example, and with this I will end, is that of uh, the Tesla of today. I go back to the year 2007, I was in Singapore. The market cap for Shell Group at that time was close to $220 billion. The market capitalization for Tesla at that time was close to $20 billion. It had just gone public a few years back, small company. Shell Group stays at about 150, 180, 120, depending on the day you look at, uh, you know, uh, the price of uh, the RDS share. A Tesla today is worth a trillion dollar company. What did they do right? 
they fundamentally created a vehicle which there was an underlying demand and they managed to kind of you know bring something competitive to the market which people appreciate that's creativity that's risk uh, that's uh, you know that's uh, the capability of understanding market needs responding to the market faster than others because parallel to tesla you know what people do, often miss is that there were about 100 other companies tinkering with the electric car none of them have succeeded in the same way many of them have gone bankrupt and so there was a guy out there who created the right mix of technology and you know market understanding and risk and created something and that's the, what the future energy company will look like for pakistan for everywhere else in the world so I will be for, uh, quiet now. As, and then... as far as uh, uh, Pakistan is concerned, I think at some stage, uh, uh, I would like to know that, uh, you see, every country has its own financial position, which is the economics, how the uh, economics of that country is working. And uh, with the discovery of coal, uh, which is an abundant quantity available in Thar, uh, it is not clean, but it is cheap. And it is going to, it's indigenous, which will not require any foreign currency for Pakistan. Uh, looking at our current uh, account uh, position also, foreign currency account uh, balances. So uh, uh, just mull over it because going forward, maybe that will be a question that vis-a-vis -vis the affordability, can we directly follow the Western countries and Tesla and all those, or it will be a mixed bag where some affordable energy within Pakistan, availability of which is there, can also be used. Because Sir, you then, want me to respond to it now or yes, later? Uh, okay, let's let's hear it out now. No, no, yeah, I leave it to you. Yeah, you tell me. Carry on, carry on. Then we'll move oh, on to the next one. You, I'll give you three minutes for that quickly. <laughs> okay. I will, I will, I will keep it to two. Okay. Pakistan is a, is a country where demand for everything is growing and it will grow. We have one of the youngest populations in the world. Yeah. The beauty to Pakistan is this capacity for all. In Pakistan, cost will always be an important driver. But one of the things that we kind of miss in the country is that a lot of what happens in our country is driven by global happenings. So let me give you an example. When I was growing up, there were hardly any Chinese products in the market. And, you know, those that were there, they were, you know, not really high quality. You would end up buying a British uh, pencil or a Pakistani pencil or a German clock uh, or, or a Japanese uh, product uh, because they were the, you know, the right mix of technology and price. And same is going to happen with energy. So we will have a base load, inshallah, Heidel, coal, wind, solar, uh, oil and gas based, furnace, etc. You'll have a base load. But then, you know, there will be changes in the market which will drive the consumer and the energy mix. I will give you a very concrete example. I worked out in 2005 in Shell Center, London. The price of oil equivalent for the solar technology of that day. And I realized that the solar technology that day, even the most efficient, would compete with oil at $200 a barrel. Mm -hmm. Today it competes with oil at under 20 or under 30. So what has happened? Pakistan had nothing to do with it, but solar cells have become a lot cheaper and a lot easier and a lot more flexible. And when you go out to your villages, you see houses with uh, two goats, uh, two sheep, maybe a cow, and a solar cell. And in the house, you see a bulb lit with that solar cell. And that's an energy transition you're seeing. Because before they were using the solar cell, now they have put a solar cell and put a small battery with it. In a pretty you know, cost-efficient way, because the Chinese have made it happen. We don't have to take it from them, but it's happened. So, you know, you can affect this coal too. Yeah. Back to yourselves. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Harun. That was a good intro. And uh, uh, Adil Saab. Adil Saab, uh, uh, fortunately, uh, works for a company which is the only company in Pakistan totally integrated. Exploration may be here. You're also in the refining business. You're also in the oil marketing business. 
So Adil Saab, we'll take your views on these three uh, points that I had mentioned earlier on, like the challenges your company is facing in this particular scenario, the trends in your uh, uh, company or companies, and the future that you, your company sees, that how should you be positioned for the future? Let's hear you out, Adil Saab. Thank you. Thank you, Adil Saab. Since you have mentioned uh, the integrated nature of the Autopile Group, I would like to share that uh, Autopile Company happened to be the first energy company or oil and gas company in this part of the world. And it discovered oil as early as 1915. And interestingly, as Harun mentioned how things are transitioning, at that time when the oil was discovered, the only product being used was only kerosene oil. So later on, our refinery, like Attic Refinery, was set up in 1922. It was commissioned in 1922. Again, this was the second, this is the second oldest refinery in the whole Indian subcontinent. Anyway, so uh, Harun is a uh, Sharyar are already here to take care of the OMC business. So I've, I'll focus my talk on the refining sector. And if you allow me, let me start with sort of introduction or give you some salient features of the refining sectors of Pakistan. So what we have is that, uh, and as I believe, or I can presumably presume safely that most of the participants are members of ICAP. So they would feel probably more at ease with some numbers. So I can share the sharing of some percentages and numbers as well. So right now we have five major refineries in Pakistan. And uh, namely, Parco, National Refinery, Pakistan Refinery, Attic Refinery, Baiko. Uh, these are the major five refineries. Out of these, uh, National Refinery, PRL, and Baiko, they're located in the south, in Karachi area. And Parco is mid country, uh, near Muzaffargarh, and Attic Refinery is, of course, in Rajbindi. Now, the total capacity in terms of barrels per day is about 420,000 barrels per day of all these refineries combined, which in terms would mean almost 19 million tons per annum. So there's the capacity. These are the refineries we have. Now, of course, uh, ARL happens to be the oldest. And uh, interestingly, you know, all, over all these years, we've been hearing about new refineries coming up in this sector. I remember as far as back as almost 15 years back, we would hear names like Indus Refinery coming up, a Trans-Asia Refinery coming up near Karachi. In fact, uh, probably trans it was Trans-Asia, which major equipment also arrived and is still lying somewhere in the desert. It must be now gone up by now. And then like uh, last four or five years back, the KP government signed at least five MOUs with different companies to set up refineries in the Khyber Pukhtunkhwa area. You would recall that about a year or two years back, Saudi Arabia Aramco announced setting up a 300,000 barrel refinery near Gawadar. Then uh, we keep hearing about, about say 30 years back, there was the talk of Pak Iran refinery. That land is now with the power project of Khaliqa refinery. What I mean is that we have been hearing about new refineries coming up but we don't see any real progress in this area. So uh, coming back to figures, so like these refineries are meeting about, like I'm taking figures of uh, 18, 19, because these are published figures by OCSC, shared by OCSC, so they're authentic figures. So 18, 19, the total demand was about, again, it's almost stagnant now for 19 million tons per annum. So for total oil, products. And these refineries were meeting only, they were, they were operating at about 66% throughput, 1819, which comes to about 12.71 million tons in that year. Out of this, these refineries processed 28% local indigenous crude and 72% was imported crude oil. Now, for quite a few years, the local crude production has been stagnant around 80 to 90,000 barrels per day. So we are heavily depending on imports in form of crude oil products. Our major imports are diesel, HSD, 
in more gas, motor gasoline. Furnace oil, of course, it is going down, as you all of you must be aware. Like about four or five years back, our total demand for furnace oil was more than 9 million tons per annum. And last year, it was down to almost 3.4 million tons. It's because more and more power plants are moving to other energy sources. From country point of view, the energy mix has improved. Number of coal projects have come online. LNG, huge projects on LNG have come online. Hydel is also going up. So demand for furnace oil is drastically going down. So this is one of the challenges which the refining sector is facing, how to dispose of our furnace oil. So like if we take the total indigenous contribution in our oil demand, there's about 18%. And the balance 82% is imported either in the form of crude oil or products, mainly HSD and uh, Now, let me say a few words about why do we need to have local refineries? In the last year or so, a number of statements have come out at the highest level from the government or non-government sectors that why do we need to have local refineries? They're too old, they're too inefficient, whatever. And why we don't just simply shut them down and go for imports 100%, why not? That's a question which has been posed by many. Now refineries have, and it's not only for Pakistan, for every country, refineries are considered to be strategic assets. Why? Like for example, you would recall that both in 1965, some of you were as old as me, they would of course recall that in both 1965 and 71 war, Atak refinery was the first to be attacked by the enemy because we happens to be the only refinery in the North. So was uh, Kemadi terminals in 70, 71 war. So oil is a strategic asset. And unfortunately, though I can't talk much about that aspect on a public forum like this, but unfortunately we do not have what they call strategic storages of petroleum products in Pakistan. Now, we often talk about Indian examples. What did India do? In the year 2000, they came up with a 25 years vision for the refining sector. And the main target was that we need to meet at least 90% of what we call middle distillates, mainly diesel, of the country requirement by local refineries. And they achieved it much earlier, say within five, six years, they crossed that barrier. And of course, as you all know, India today has the, probably the largest refining sector, not only in terms of volumes, but also in terms of quality of products. And they're exporting to places like California, which has the most stringent environment-friendly specifications. How did that happen? I'll come to that later. So it's not only that refineries are strategic assets, we also save a lot of foreign exchange for the country. In simple words, it's always cheaper to import crude oil as compared to importing of products. Then it also provides the only outlet for the local indigenous crude oil. Like for example, right now, about I would say, last year I think uh, the figure has even gone down to about 75,000 barrels per day, the local production. And majority of it, or most of it, is coming from Khyber Pukhtunkhwa directly to Atik refinery. In case of, if you don't, don't have these refineries, or if, uh, uh, God forbid, if Atik refinery is no more there, this crude would have to be taken all the way to the port to be exported. And even now, some of the crude, which cannot be processed locally, it has to be imported in terms of uh, sort of uh, condensates, what we call condensates. So this would be a nightmare logistically as well as financially. Then, of course, the refining sector pay billions of duties and taxes to the government of Pakistan. And also in terms of uh, meeting the local demand, the refineries are meeting 60% of the total petroleum products demand, 60% of diesel demand, and about 30% of motor gasoline. 
and we are meeting 100%, almost 100% of jet fuel and kerosene demand. Now, after giving you this introduction, let me take a sip of my tea. Your introduction has taken your entire time. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, okay. so, yeah, so I'll, we, uh, I'll try to be, I'll try to be brief now. Yeah, please. What are the challenges we are facing right now? The challenge we are facing right now is, especially within the last two, three years, the, the refinery margins are too low now, right now. It's almost negative at times. Like I recall a few years back, the margin on diesel would be around 10 to $12 per barrel. Motor gasoline would be maybe eight, nine, $10 per barrel. Only about a month back, the margin on motor gasoline was negative. Even now the margin on diesel is almost zero. It's almost the same price as crude oil. Is. These are, I'm talking about international prices. So it's, it's extremely difficult for us, for the refineries, to operate on these negative or very thin margins. But uh, other the, sab, the, just to, uh, to, yeah. to make a small comment here, the reason why you have very small refining margin is because of the technology of the refinery, which is hydro skimming versus deep conversion refineries, which we know have much higher margins. So the challenge is basically to move uh, our refineries towards deep conversion. Yeah. Yagub, yeah. Yagub, sir, let me tell you this. Yeah. Even if we were deep conversion today with these margins, we would still have been unsustainable. Let me give you an example. You must have read about it. Even in the US, number of refineries are being closed. Some are converting to biofuels. Only two weeks back, there was a news item in Australia. Their refineries had to be given subsidy by the government, I think about $1.5 billion to keep them running. So these are not hydroskipping refineries in Australia and US. So even for a deep conversion refineries, it's, it's quite difficult to sustain, to keep, uh, I mean, to keep running, operating. So this is a challenge, generally. It's all over the world. Then another problem we have is, it, like the history shows that in Pakistan, the, the product specifications, we have gone for abrupt changes. Like I recall when we were having 87 round of motor gasoline, then the past government came up with 92 round without giving us any time to go up. Only recently they've gone Euro 5 without even having consultation with the stakeholders. So these kind of, you know, these improvements or upgrading upgradations needs time and need timelines. Then of course, you must all of you be familiar with the, pro the problem of furnace oil disposal right now. About three years back, the government decided to shut down all the furnace fuel based power plants. I mean, at least that they, they wished for, but though they're still running to some extent even now. So the refinery was faced with this challenge because you know, we don't have a choice. If the refinery runs, especially our kind of refineries, furnace oil has to be produced. We cannot just shut it off like that. On top of that, another challenge come, came up of IMO 2020. So starting January this year, 2020, the specification of furnace oil internationally was drastically reduced in terms of sulfur. So previously like 3.5% sulfur was allowed, it came down to 0.5 of sulfur. So all these furnace oil used in shipping, we couldn't sell that. So the prices were drastically reduced. So this was a challenge which came up. Another challenge for the refinery, which has been there for years, but now we are, this year we are really feeling the crunch now, is smuggling going on from Iran side of petroleum products into Pakistan. It has been there for ages, but like, and, and you know, we, we noted that especially when January, uh, sorry, in June this year, when there was huge uh, shortages of uh, petroleum products in Pakistan, one of the reason was that because of COVID, the smuggling had so, sort of stopped across the border and the demand had just gone up like, like anything. at least more than 100,000 tons of demand, increase in demand was, could have been attributed to the smuggling from Iran, which was stopped at that time. Now I think it has opened up again. And again, we are facing right now this challenge of disposing of even our diesel right now. Then problems like turnover tax, things like that. And uh, the, the, I think 
what we need to focus is there in case of policies. This would be my last point uh, under the, this topic of challenges we are facing right now. Petroleum policy for the downstream sector, which is currently applicable, that was made in 1997. So it's more than 23 years, it has not been updated. And we have been asking the government, things have completely changed. It has yet to be updated. And unless we come up with a policy which gives enough incentives to the government, to the refineries, we cannot even think of upgrading our refineries. So Yakutsab, as you mentioned, we are fully conscious of this thing that we have to upgrade. We like to get rid of our furnace oil or to reduce it. We have to go for hydro crackers or other technologies to produce more value added products. No, no question about that. But to go for that, like, you know, this refinery sector is so much capital intensive. Like every refinery would have to invest at least $1 billion every refinery. So total five to $6 billion would have to be invested to upgrade our refineries. Under the current circumstances, the bottom line we are, we are having is simply not possible to even consider this. So the good thing happening, which right now is that we have been in serious uh, negotiations or consultation or brainstorming sessions with the government, especially at least for this uh, whole month of September, we have been having regular meeting with the ministry, uh, with the petroleum division. And the positive thing we note is that there seems to be at least now some realization that refineries have serious problems and challenges. And hopefully we are hoping that the government would come up with some measures to provide us a breathing space, not only to continue operation, but also to go for upgradation of the refineries. So that's what we are hoping for. To give you an idea of the refinery losses which we have suffered in 19, 2018-19, all the refineries combined suffered a loss of 35 billion rupees. This was mainly because of rupee devaluation in that year. In 1920, we suffered, all the refineries combined suffered a loss of 25 billion rupees. Now this was mainly because of COVID-19. Only in March and April, we suffered a loss of about 47 billion rupees only because of inventory losses, the refineries combined. Now talking about the last, you have the way forward for the energy company of the future. So I'll just take maybe a, a minute or two. Of course, as uh, Harun mentioned, we have to keep with the times and uh, we simply cannot ignore. Though the per capita energy consumption in Pakistan is still very low. And unfortunately, because of this stagnation in the economy, the demand has been almost stagnant, as I mentioned earlier, about 19, 20 million tons per year. But I mean, being an optimist, I'm sure that this energy demand would pick up. And in spite of a reality which we are facing, which is which we can see coming up, the electric vehicles, solarization, things, new technologies like that, I personally feel that still for the next 20 years, 15, 20 years, these refineries will still be needed. The need for fossil fuels is not going to disappear that soon. Of course, the demand is going to go down and uh, hopefully uh, in, in conjunction with that, the demand, if the economy picks up, the demand will also go up. So probably we would still survive for some time to come. We in the ATA group are seriously taking these challenges we are considering various measures for diversification. We started working on solars about four, five years back. So we're starting from simple R&D with our own facilities. Right now, we are setting up 1.1 megawatt solar facility for offices here in Morga. My, my old Arctic refinery office was equipped with a solar system almost four years back, our own indigenously built in. So we are getting ready for those, those uh, face those kind of challenges and the new technologies. And I think I, uh, another positive thing uh, which I would like to mention, because we are good at uh, sort of uh, blaming the government for everything, but some positive things have also happened. In addition to what the negotiations we are having with the government right now, that only about a few months back, they agreed to 
one month back, I would say, agreed to change the pricing uh, time to fortnightly from one month. Ideally, we should be going, moving, hopefully, to a, a weekly announcement of prices or maybe ultimately daily basis. Another thing, positive thing which the government did was that they have now given us the uh, actual exchange rate. So that so hopefully it would sort of provide some protection against the rupee devaluation in future. So I would end here and then um, you can ask any question you would so, like to. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adil Saab. I think that was a very good uh, overview. Just a caution on the pricing that you have for two week bi-weekly or twice a month pricing fortnightly. It's very, it looks very good to the government when the prices are going down. So every two weeks, there is a good news. But when the prices start going up and you give a bad news every two weeks, then you'll go back to the one month <laughs> pricing. That's I at know. least my personal experience. Yeah. Yeah, so, but you know, even, uh, okay, may, may I? Even, you know, when the prices are going up, previously what it used to happen was, that the whole month would be reflected at the end of the month. So if the prices was going up throughout the month, there would be a big increase coming up at the end of the month. So at yeah. least it would give them some respite that after 15 days, the rise would be half of what would be at, what would have been at the end of the month. So I, think I wish you much. all good luck. I wish yeah, you all good you. luck thank in you. that area. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, now we come to Sarfaraz uh, Shariar. Shariar the, uh, is... Uh, looking at marketing of one of the largest company in the country. And I'm sure you have a story to tell, uh, Sharia. PSO has a lot of other responsibilities. When others are away, then you come in and you bail out the country uh, in bad times. So I'm sure uh, uh, these past six months were uh, really very challenging. But uh, looking at your uh, numbers, I was very happy to see that uh, you did well. So let's hear you out on these three areas, your challenges, the trends that you see, and the future that you see in PSO. Okay. Uh, thank you, Yaku. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, so I will um, sort of uh, answer in two sections, primarily starting with the impact of the lockdown uh, and what we faced, what the learnings were from that. Uh, and then I will talk about the uh, the investment in infrastructure, et cetera, which was the second part of the thing, and then um, going forward about the future. So um, like everybody else and like the entire world, when we started the lockdown, um, uh, third week of March, uh, we saw an immediate uh, precipitous drop in uh, the consumption of our fuel products. Um, uh, obviously, motor gasoline and, and diesel uh, just dropped off the cliff. Uh, I think we were down about 65% on our daily run rate. So, um, uh, similarly, for our um, uh, aviation fuel, because the uh, flight start, stopped running, uh, we saw a huge reduction in our aviation because we are basically the industry in Pakistan. Uh, so, our aviation uh, went down significantly. And that, uh, to a large degree, is still down to about half of what we were doing pre-COVID. Uh, but the interesting thing was, and, and Adil Saab also mentioned this um, uh, earlier, is that in about three and a half weeks, uh, which was sort of the third week of April, we started to see an uptick in the demand. Now, this, this whole scenario was also overlaid with the challenge of rapidly declining prices over the same time period. So our challenges were multiple. One was how to sustain a, a supply chain, which is, um, you know, uh, because we are public sector, our supply chain is, is uh, or our timelines for supply are much longer than they would be for a, a private sector organization because we follow the public procurement um, rules. So we had a lot of cargoes on order, which uh, suddenly looked very uncertain as to when those cargoes would be able to come in, berth, and, and uh, be able to sort of sell them off. So we had to, on the one hand, backstop our, our supply chain and hold off a lot of the cargoes that we had ordered for both diesel and motor gasoline. Uh, and in that, uh, particularly for diesel, our relationship with Kuwait Petroleum was, was very, very, uh, instrumental in us being able to manage that. Uh, and motor gasoline, because we had um, orders against tenders, 
uh, we were able to postpone them in part, you know, in consultation with our suppliers. Um, on the downstream side, uh, like I said, in about three weeks, we started to see an uptick. And that uh, increase in volumes continued uh, um, all the way through June. Uh, and the reason for that, uh, particularly for diesel, as Adil Saab mentioned, is that we had a lot of diesel coming in over the last two or three years uh, from outside Pakistan through irregular sources. And that stopped because the borders were sealed because of COVID. So that stopped and we saw a huge spike in, in diesel requirements. So all of the cargoes that we had um, uh, sort of canceled or deferred, we started to bring those back again. Um, uh, the kicker on top of all of this was the pricing because as the pricing dropped, you know, as people in this industry know, uh, your net realizable value for uh, your product starts to go down. Um, in the month of June, for example, at PSO and probably all of us uh, or the, in the industry, downstream industry, we were losing about 20 rupees a liter for everything we were selling. And because of that reason, uh, many of the smaller companies um, or other companies um, started backing off their sales because, uh, you know, when you have very small margins to begin with and you're losing 20 rupees a liter, they did not, they, they held off on some of their sales. So as a result of that, a lot of the other OMC's outlets started to go dry and there was intense pressure on, on PSO uh, to keep the, uh, the supply chain of fuels running. And um, uh, you know, fortunately, we were able to do that. Uh, uh, you know, our market share for the month of June uh, skyrocketed into the 60s and 50s for diesel and motor gasoline. Um, it was a very, very tough time uh, because there was uh, intense pressure. Our supply chains were uh, restricted as well. We couldn't uh, take on the entire volumes of the industry. Uh, so the operations for about a month and a half uh, was under intense pressure uh, by our dealers and by, uh, you know, uh, because all of our outlets had, uh, you know, long lineups and a lot of the other outlets had shut down. So they started coming back online towards the back half of June. Um, and that improved a little bit, but it was a very, very challenging time for us. So I think some of the key learnings for us there, uh, and I think, you know, sort of a no-brainer is that the uh, volume of storages that we have, and this is something that PSO uh, has been investing heavily in in the last two years, is to increase our storages, both uh, building new storages, mainly up country, as well as repurposing a lot of these storages that we have in, uh, which were for originally for furnace oil. Um, because as Adil Saab mentioned earlier, the fennel soil consumption has been declining significantly over the last few years. So we are trying to repurpose uh, a lot of our storages now to uh, motor gasoline and high-speed diesel. So that is critical uh, for, for everybody in the industry, for all the players, and there are, <clears throat> excuse me, there are a lot of players in the industry, for, for the entire industry to look at developing storages. The matter of strategic storage is where the government funds the construction and the uh, uh, maintenance of storages uh, is, a, is a bigger one that perhaps we cannot answer in this session. But I think it's incumbent upon all of the individual companies to uh, you know, build their own storages and to increase that so that these sort of situations don't arise. I think the other big challenge we, we all face now uh, is port infrastructure. Because right now uh, we have only two ports where uh, um, petroleum products are coming in. One is Kimari and one is Port Kassim. Uh, at Kimari, uh, the uh, number of ships coming in, I mean, regardless of the port infrastructure, the number of ships is declining uh, and the number of cargoes coming into Port Kassim is increasing because Port Kassim is connected to the white oil pipeline which is going to be going multi-grade you know, over the next couple of months or whenever the, all the connectivities are in place. So as a result of that, there's going to be immense pressure uh, on the Port Kasim infrastructure. And we are already seeing that with extensive delays in the berthing of cargoes. I'm sure uh, Harun and, and uh, Adil Saab are also 
seeing similar delays and lots of demurrages uh, for our cargoes there. So uh, developing the port infrastructure uh, is vital uh, in order to uh, ensure that the, the, uh, we reduce the fragility of the supply chain. Because right now it is highly dependent on these two ports, which uh, particularly Kimari is aging and now being used less and less because as once motor gasoline goes into the white oil pipeline, uh, Port Carson will become uh, highly critical. And uh, I think there will be more pressure on our, on, uh, our costs because of high demurrages uh, incurred because of late um, berthing of vessels. So this, this is some of the, uh, you know, sort of a, a recap of where we were, uh, you know, from the April, May, June uh, period. Um, now, in terms of talking about the future, I think there's been some discussion. Harun has also mentioned, uh, you know, the, the sort of evolution of uh, renewables. But I think if we look at the evolution of renewables around the world, uh, there are actually very few countries uh, which are uh, actually moving or have moved a significant part of their, uh, their energy to renewables. Um, if I look at North America, and I look at particularly the automotive industry in North America, the, uh, you know, the, the electric vehicles are less than 1% of the total cars on the road. And this is, you know, after 15 or 20 years, of the EVs being um, uh, sort of in place. Although they are growing at a higher rate, uh, we are, uh, I, I don't think that in Pakistan, we're going to see some very rapid adoption uh, of electric vehicles, even in the next five to 10 years. I, I think the first, um, we'll probably start to see that in the, in the motorcycle sector, Automobiles is going to be a long time coming because, uh, you know, A, we just can't afford it. B, it doesn't make sense to produce electricity with, uh, you know, so-called dirty fuels and then, you know, uh, run electric vehicles in that because it sort of defeats the purpose. Uh, because if we're producing fuel, you know, or power on coal and on uh, gas and, uh, you know, some furnace oil uh, primarily, uh, then it doesn't make sense to to do that. It only makes sense if the whole uh, chain is, uh, is clean. Uh, as we're starting to see in some countries like Germany and Denmark and some of them uh, who are investing heavily in that. So I, I think, uh, you know, I would agree with Adil that uh, the, we are, you know, in Pakistan at least in the kind of growth in energy, we are, um, you know, I, I don't think this industry is going to go away for at least the next 30 or 40 years. Uh, yes, there will be changes, um, uh, perhaps at a smaller scale at individual levels, as you know, many people are uh, electrifying their homes through solar. Uh, I think some people on the panel itself have, uh, you know, installed those. So uh, that will uh, gradually change, but I think that it will not have a major impact on the oil and gas industry, at least in the next 10 years. Uh, I think we will continue to do business pretty much the same way as we have been. Uh, the challenges are more, uh, uh, I think, regulatory because the in a in a developing country with low per capita incomes like Pakistan, the challenge for the government is to balance the business interests with the consumer interests, and because the consumer affordability is generally low, um, uh, hence the regulation uh, for most governments tends to favour the consumer. Uh, rather than businesses, uh, which is why, as you know, some of the numbers for the refinery losses that um, uh, Adil has mentioned, we are, uh, you know, similar numbers uh, have been seen by a lot of the OMCs, including PSO, uh, for this year, where, um, you know, we, we have a loss for uh, the financial year because of the uh, inventory losses we suffered in the last quarter. So I think that. Uh, you know, this is this is something that the industry will have to continue to bear, uh, at least for the short term. Uh, I don't foresee a, a, a major change in the way the the uh, pricing is done. It will still be cautious, uh, you know, with primarily the consumer in mind, 
uh, both for uh, for all energy prices, whether it's gas or whether it's uh, petroleum or power. Uh, so that, um, you know, I, I think organizations are going to have to find their own efficiencies. Uh, and uh, at PSO also, we're looking at, at um, reducing a lot of our expenses. We're looking to automate a lot of our processes, uh, improve the time that we uh, are taking to, uh, to conduct a lot of our business. Um, so I, I think over the next 12 to 24 months, there will be significant changes in um, our cost structures in terms of how we manage our business. So that, those are some of the things that we are looking at individually as an organization. So I'll, I'll end it now and, and over to you, Yaku. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Shariar. Uh, and sorry, I forgot to thank you because uh, uh, people should know that Shariar is in Toronto. And he joined us 6 a.m. in the morning. So that's the passion he has, you know, for the industry. Yes. So thank you very much, Shadiar. And uh, again, talking of the electric vehicles, I was glad to see a charging station installed by you in Islamabad. So that was, uh, I think, a good uh, good sign that you've given. Gigi, okay. and there'll be a few more of those, okay. but, uh, <laughs> you know, strategically placed. Yeah. Okay, now it's over to Fawad for a minute because he wants to uh, put a poll question uh, for the yeah, viewers. If, yeah. if, if I may add, if yeah, yeah. I may add, Arctic Petroleum has also installed a fast charging station right okay. there at the blue area in Islamabad. Excellent, excellent. That's I, I, I didn't hear about it, so I, that's why it's not in my mind. <laughs> Very good then. If, uh, if you have installed it, then excellent. Uh, if somebody has an electric vehicle, you can charge it in Islamabad at the moment only, right? Not in any any other city. Yes, Fawad, over to you. Uh, we will be running a poll. Uh, we will give a minute break to all the speakers. Uh, all the participants are requested to please uh, participate in this poll. Uh, we will be sharing the results in a minute's time and then so our first question is what is your prediction on the time frame in which the oil demand will improve is this a global one or a pakistan question uh it's uh, it's both it's a trick, trick question <laughs> Okay. The answers for the two might be different. Okay. <laughs> I think let, let the question be for global okay. because that is what will drive the international prices. So if the demand goes up, the prices go up. So people have to now guess as to when will oil start moving up. If at all, it will move up. So it's a function of demand supply. So, interestingly, most of the participants feel that uh, it's a one year to two year time horizon when, in which the oil demand will improve. Mm -hmm. And 34% and believe that it would be within six months to a year's time. Thank you. Good, that was interesting. Harun, uh, I'll, we'll start our question and answer sessions and uh, there are a couple of questions I have. Uh, the one that I want to ask you, Harun, is on the local scenario now. As we have seen, there's a mushroom growth. I drove from here to Islamabad and I can't remember how many different types of uh, companies that have started, you know. There's a mushroom growth of fuel stations and oil marketing companies in the country. And... Uh, the amount of license that the government has given uh, was uh, is uh, naturally the, the two ways on it, two points on it, right? Like, uh, uh, yes, it will create a lot of competition between uh, the oil marketing companies, but then there should be a limit of the number of uh, companies uh, which have been given licenses. So I'd like to take your view now. Are you seeing any mergers and acquisitions now happening in this industry because of so many players? I'm not sure if they'll all be able to make money or uh, if all have the deep pockets and capacity to sustain those losses that uh, some of the majors have sustained over the past uh, in the past one year 
So what's your view on this and uh, what opinion do you have so that you know, it can be, this can be an input into the government of Pakistan's policy making? You, you're, you have to open your mic, uh, Harun. Until you ask a very deep question, I will yeah, try I to, <laughs> <laughs> I will try to keep the answer brief. Uh, we are a regulated market in the margin structure allowed. One of the first things we need to ask ourselves is, can, are we sustainable as an industry? What do I mean? My forefathers, when my, you know, parents and grandparents and, you know, seven generations have lived on this in this part of uh, India or Pakistan, this, this subcontinent. And probably the last seven generations had clean drinking water. They had access to clean air. They were a tribal community. We would live in tribes, you'd survive in tribes. But you know, the basics were good. Clean air, clean water, clean environment. What have we delivered to them? And our industry has a contribution and I'll go to that contribution and then answer your question. What, what have we delivered to them today? Today, if anyone thinks they have clean air, dude, think again, you don't. Our air quality is one of the worst in the world. And you know, if you think that uh, Pakistan had nothing to do with it, sub India se gaya, to think again. Amritsar ka air quality lahor se better. Ye band Stop blaming others. Subsoil water hum taba kar chuke. And you know, when I say taba kar chuke, I mean taba kar chuke. Kyunke Faisla Abad Kirgirth ke gaon mein 14 saal ke bachchon ke sofed baal hai. Jo, when I was growing up, to gaon mein aur shahar mein ek bada fark hota tha. Gaon mein na ganja milta tha, na enku milta tha. Shahar mein aur khas taur pe shell mein जो एनक नहीं पहनता था उसमें कांटेक्ट लेंस लगाए होते थे हमने माशाल्लाह वो फर्क भी तबाह कर दी जिस स्पीड में जा रहे हैं बहुत जल्दी बच्चों को पांचवीं बर्थडे पे एक ऑक्सीजन का सिलेंडर गिफ्ट किया जाएगा बेटा इससे हवा पी लेना एंड टू से कि हमारी इंडस्ट्री का उससे कोई तल्लुक नहीं इज अ बंच ऑफ नॉनसेंस इस मुल्क में 12 15000 पंप्स हैं आधों ने नीचे सोयल के अंदर तेल लीक किया हुआ आपके मार्जिन में इतनी गुंजाइश ही नहीं ना आपके रेगुलेटरी स्ट्रक्चर में इतनी एनफोर्समेंट है कि उसको लीक को फिक्स करें जाके डेपोस हैं बड़ी-बड़ी कंपनियों का नाम नहीं लूंगा एक-एक डेपो के नीचे तेल लीक हुआ होगा उस तेल को साफ करने के लिए पूरी कंपनियां बैंक्रप्ट हो जाएंगी अगेन मैं नाम नहीं लूंगा बट यू नो डोंट गेट योरसेल्फ वी हैव अ बिग मैसिव प्रॉब्लम टू व्हिच वी हैव वी आर कंट्रीब्यूटर्स एज एन इंडस्ट्री ये जो एनवायरमेंट ये जो रेगुलेटरी स्ट्रक्चर है और ये जो 35 मार्केटिंग कंपनीज बन गई हैं दिस इज मल्टीप्लाइंग द प्रॉब्लम तीन के डब्बों में तेल रख के बेच देने से इंडस्ट्री नहीं इंप्रूव होगी सो आई एक तमाशे के और कुछ नहीं खड़ा हो रहा जिस दिन इस तमाशे में पाकिस्तान जागेगा जो मीडिया हेडलाइंस आनी है जो पब्लिक अनरेस्ट आना है इसी को संभाला नहीं जाना you know the solution lies in responsible governance and in responsible operations and it also lies in a reasonable margin now margin reasonable and our responsible governance and our responsible operators aur jitna ye companies multiply ho rahe hain utna problem multiply ho raha hai i will not name anyone because it's not appropriate lekin to say ki humko bade you know acche future ko dekh rahe hain that's nonsense dude we are looking at serious serious problems in front of us and you know the solution is in good governance responsible governance restructuring of the laws 165 laws hain jo all industry ko govern karte hain government mein ek banda bata do jisko 165 laws ka pata ho ek banda bata do industry ke char bande bata do jinko pata ho nahi pata wo main isliye keh raha hu ki maine pwc ko bahut paise diye the wo laws jama karne ke liye कौन सा रेगुलेटरी बॉडी रेगुलेटरी बॉडीज का हाल ये एक ये बिल्कुल ऐसे मोटरवे पे आप चलते हुए जाएं एक बॉडी आपको बोले यार तुम 40 से ऊपर गए तो मैं तुम्हारे को नाक के हवाले करूंगा एक दूसरी 
पुलिस वाला खड़ा हो तुम एक सौ पैंतीस से नीचे ऊपर गया तो मैं तो मैंने आपके हवाले करूं बाबा आप चालीस वाले की माने एक सौ बीस वाले की माने सो यू नो द प्रॉब्लम्स आर डीप दे आर समथिंग टू डू विद गवर्नेंस दिस मशरूमिंग इज नॉट बींग डन रेस्पॉन्सिबली एंड इट विल एट द एंड टेक अ प्राइस ऑन द ऑर्डनरी सिटीजन ऑफ पाकिस्तान the fixes are obvious they are not very difficult but they need thought they need determination and they need implementation i hope i answered your question yakub sir about uh, like you know this can't can continue for long everybody cannot make money uh, with so many few uh, omcs so you are you seeing any mergers and acquisition going on in the future I see closures. I see mergers. I see media hype. I see volatility. I see alzam tarashi. I see unnecessary huwa. I see mm-hmm. big responsible companies losing out. Mm-hmm. I see lots of things happening. Okay, that was I think. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, you you are clearly not very happy with the situation at the moment. <laughs> no, it, it, because it's not yeah. helping our country. Look, okay, end of the day. Exactly. आपने एनवायरनमेंट तो पहले ही तबाह कर दी है अब बच्चों को आपने ये कहना है कि यार तुम एक ऑक्सीजन का सिलेंडर भी ले आओ साथ राइट <laughs> right. अच्छा आदिल साहब आपसे एक सवाल जो व्हाट आई वांट टू आस्क यू इज वी ब्रीफली टच्ड अपॉन द डीप कन्वर्जन एंड द हाइड्रो स्किमिंग रिफाइनरी एंड देयर इज अ नीड टू मूव टुवर्ड्स बेटर टेक्नोलॉजी सो दैट यू कैन प्रोड्यूस बेटर फ्यूल यू कैन रिड्यूस फर्नेस ऑयल एंड यू कैन यू नो बिकम अ प्रॉफिटेबल Uh, organization and an industry uh, as a whole so that you can add value to the uh, to the country's economy now the point is uh, what aspect of regulate regulations and policy making is restricting you from that jo aapne briefly touch kiya tha you had mentioned ke hum government ke sath baat kar rahe hain discussion kar rahe hain Give, give give us a few pointers like uh, what is exactly happening what discussions are going on and what yeah. are your recommendations so that you are given a good playing field and all refineries in pakistan start you know uh, becoming a very profitable one and uh, make more uh, better quality products ji uh, i think before i answer this question let me just say a few words with uh, aid a few words what harun said about what's happening or this regulation of the industry i think is we you know with these mushroom growth of oil marketing companies the role of ogra has become very very important if in order to it become to be ogra to become a real regulatory authority they need to increase its capacity there are serious capacity constraints like you know expecting ogra in its present form to keep keep track of the quality issues even these uh, this issue regarding this uh, holding so called holding or stocks keeping minimum days of stock things like that they simply cannot monitor with the current setup they have so i think uh, ogra needs to be strengthened its capacity need to be increased take care of all these quality issues as well as other issues okay coming back to your question as far as refineries are concerned all refineries are very fully conscious of the fact that we have to upgrade because we simply cannot postpone improving our specification or keeping pace with the world i mean the like look at india surrounding countries so uh, like we have to gear up for not only euro 5 but euro 6 and even other coming up in future specifications coming up in future as well so right now you know as i explained in the beginning the current financial position simply does not allow us to go for these kind of heavy investment as i mentioned at least the refineries would be needing 5 to 6 billion dollar to upgrade the refineries or combined so what we are like you know like to face this furnace oil issue to upgrade furnace oil you need to set up a hydro cracker or some other technology to convert furnace oil into high value products like diesel or motor gasoline so one proposal which we are currently considering all refineries to set up a joint hydro cracker somewhere say maybe mid country or somewhere in which all the refineries can send their furnace oil to that jointly owned hydro cracker to upgrade their furnace oils this is one and it seems as economies of scale would come in 
and then logistic would also help. So this is one of the proposals which is currently under consideration, but it is just to be seen, proper feasibility is carried out to see whether it can be done, whether it's doable or not. In addition to that, all the refineries, like some of the refineries, they're still producing diesel with uh, more, even below like Euro one diesel, I would call it, with, with higher sulfur content than uh, 500 ppm. So they, they would have to set up diesel hydro desulfurization units. Like some of the refineries like us at ARL and NR, we have already added these unit. Parco also has a DHDS unit, but some of the refineries have yet to set up this unit to take care of the sulfur content in diesel. And then some carriers, some more modification or aid ups to achieve Euro 5 standards in, in diesel. But talking of motor gasoline specifications to meet Euro 5, uh, one, uh, constraint is of a sulfur content. Fortunately, all motor gasoline produced by the local refineries meet the sulfur specification. So the sulfur content in motor gasoline is already less than 10 ppm in almost all the refineries. So that's not a big issue. But then there are other specifications like RON. Currently, we're adding some additives to improve our RON. They, the, the metallic additives ultimately have to be given up then the uh, aromatics, benzenes, these contents. So like in our case, we, we plan to set up a CCR unit, continuous catalytic reformer, which would enable us to produce Euro 5 and even higher grades of motor gasoline. So other refineries are also considering these kind of projects. So we are working on it, but the basic point is that uh, what we are creating right now with the government is to give us some protection or to enable us to take up these projects. You see, one thing I would like to make clear, the local, if the local refineries are expected to compete with the Middle Eastern or the regional refineries with no protection, they're simply not possible. I mean, the kind of economy of scales they have or other protections like no income tax and no custom duties, we simply cannot compete. So the refineries locally to survive, they would always be needing some sort of, some sort of protection is which is already provided to other industries like auto industry, pharmaceutical, steel, and other industries. So if we have to have our local refineries, they have to be provided some kind of protection. But just for uh, the, the viewers understanding, what type of protection are you looking at? Uh, do you have any specific items so that it could be understood whether it, can that be, <laughs> can that yeah, be good, done? These, these specific items are under negotiation with the government. Okay. So I think it's not, it's not the right time to come out with these things. <laughs> Once things are finalized, of course, everything mm -hmm. will be public. Okay, okay. Excellent. So thank you very much uh, for that. And now I move to Sharia. Uh, Sharia, uh, we understand that uh, in the oil business, it's the inf infrastructure at the end of the day, which really gives you the flexibility to do what you want. And uh, there are major infrastructure constraints even at the moment in the country. Now, uh, being the largest uh, throughputter in Pakistan, uh, if you force rank, what are those top uh, infrastructure investments which are really required at the moment? And if you could identify some of the really big ones, you know, the top three. Um, uh, I think, as I said earlier, uh, storages uh, would be the first one because uh, having product in storage protects you from pricing volatility as well. Uh, uh, you know, however, you know, particularly uh, as we move to, uh, you know, we move to uh, pricing every two weeks, then hopefully weekly and, and so on, daily pricing eventually when we get there, because, uh, you know, many neighboring countries have also moved to daily pricing. Um, so, so, so the, the storages for each individual OMC and for the country as a whole uh, is very important that we have uh, investment in those. Uh, I talked about ports, uh, you know, the port infrastructure, you know, because we continue to be dependent on imports. So the port infrastructure is very, very important. And uh, the third thing, obviously, I'll talk about is um, connectivity. We currently have one pipeline carrying product uh, from Karachi to uh, mid-country. Um, and that will soon become uh, a multi-grade uh, pipeline, which means there'll be less motor gasoline uh, being transported by road. 
uh, across the country, uh, obviously that will uh, positively affect the safety uh, on the roads as well as we've seen a lot of accidents happening. Uh, you know, every month there are, there are issues with, um, uh, you know, dangerous product uh, spilling in, in accidents. So I, I think that will be a good step. There is, there's also a project to link, um, uh, you know, the Punjab with the frontier uh, through pipeline uh, again for transportation. So that will bring down the overall cost of product as well. Once um, all these product, uh, these projects are uh, set up. Uh, the, the issue again, uh, as, as you know, mentioned uh, by the other panelists is uh, other margins because all of this, uh, all of this investment requires there to be healthy margins for the industry to be able to make these investments. If the margins aren't there, then you know everybody is trying to operate on you know bubble gum and scotch tape, um, you know, and 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 try and keep things running. I mean, the infrastructure is aging, particularly in the south in Karachi and Kimari. Uh, you know, these, this is very old and aging infrastructure. We we continue to have problems, um, uh, you know, with pipeline leakages, etc. So it's it's very fragile. And I think that that is something that we, we all need to be cognizant of uh, in order to do that. Uh, from a downstream perspective, uh, I think that there's really no shortage of retail outlets now, as you yourself mentioned, that, you know, there's a plethora of retail outlets across the country, you know, wherever you go, you know, it's not a problem to get fuel. Um, what quality you get or what are the safety standards, uh, you know, that, that's a big question mark. Um, so eventually, and, and just addressing one of your earlier questions regarding, um, you know, mergers or consolidations, uh, I, I think, it, I, I don't know if there would be, the, you know, so many mergers and consolidations, because a lot of these companies are sort of, you know, sort of fly-by-night operators, where they have very little investment in infrastructure. Their retail expansion model is basically, a, you know, a, a pay and set up a retail outlet type of a a, a system where they're not really invested in these outlets. You know, anybody who can come up and pay a certain fee, you know, they'll sort of give them their brand name and, and let them set up an outlet. So it's it's highly the whole system is quite unregulated and unenforced. That way. And then there are the the so-called dabba stations or, or illegal outlets, uh, you know, which are not associated directly with any oil marketing company. And there are tens of thousands of those as well. So it's going to take a lot to be able to, to sort of um, improve the governance standard, uh, improve the enforcement for, for all of these. But uh, in terms of ranking, I would say storages, ports, uh, and then connectivity in that order. Excellent. Thank you, Sharia. Excellent. Uh, uh, I had so many uh, other questions, but uh, when I saw the chat, uh, uh, our participants are really putting in a lot of questions. So Fawad says that uh, there is, you know, he's overflowing with questions. So what I'll do is I'll pause here with my questions and we take questions from the audience. And uh, are you ready, Fawad? If you can uh, flash a few of them so that our uh, panelists could uh, review and an start answering them. Uh, first, uh, we will have another poll question. Uh, oh, yes. yes, your poll, yeah. <laughs> and let's uh, uh, spread off a break. Uh, can we have the second poll question for the audience? Uh, so the second poll question is, how can oil and gas organizations remain competitive and emerge stronger? Uh, Reskilling workforce, investment in technology, diversify into renewables. So we, this is a minute.
Okay, so interesting. It is a very close tie. Uh, the, the participants feel the investment in technology uh, has got 50% and diversify into renewables has got 48%. So I think it's pretty clear that the participants feel that investment in technology and diversify in renewables is the thing of the day. Thank you very much, short panelists. I will now uh, share my screen for the question and answers, Mr. Yakub sir. Yakub sir, here we go. Yeah. Just... Uh, can you see? Can we question? use hedging to overcome volatility risk in Pakistan? with respect to oil sector. Uh, did I read it? Because uh, after Pakistan, it's not visible. I can see the W. So is it written with respect to oil sector? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Harun, you said in the beginning, you've done your MBA from LUMS. <laughs> so uh, how about giving it a shot? I, I also got this question asked. Uh, some people from the ministry called me also uh, about this thing. But I... Let my comment be at ease. Harun, let's hear you out. Sir, I will uh, give you a bit of a philosophic answer, then give you an, uh, uh, a, a past story. And between the two, hopefully, you will get the answer. <laughs> so first, I will quote you something from Saadi, which I read in my BA uh, 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 Persian book, and I still remember. Mayam ke manim tum as khak dumidam, didam tapidam, nadidam tapidam, o jayan arsidam. Which means, ke mana ke hambi tum hari tara mati ke bane hue, magar hamne de kam tarpe, hamne na de kam tarpe, or hameni samajai kaja. So, why do I say that? The problem with this hedging is, I used to, I used to sell hedging to aviation customers uh, globally in Shell long time ago. And one of my customers, he said, Arun Saab, the, we buy these hedges from you, but at the end, we always lose out. I said, why? He said, when the hedges in the money, our board accuses us that you were so silly, you had this instrument, you did not buy enough of it. When the hedges out of the money, our board accuses us, you silly men and women, you, you went out and you bought this hedge and now you know, you have gotten us into trouble. You have bought more expensive oil. So, there I think lies your answer. Uh, uh, and I purposefully, a, I purposely uh, did not ask this from Sheriyar because as you said, my board, he would have said some other institution. Because had he gone right, I have an answer to that. Uh, I, I think just on the hedging, yeah, uh, just on the hedging, um, you know, and there's been some significant talk of this over the last three or four months as prices dipped, uh, you know. Um, I, I think for, for Pakistan uh, and the way our governance and regulatory system is set up, uh, probably the best way to hedge is, again, invest in storages and buy cheap product and, and keep it for long. Uh, financial hedging or hedging brand uh, you know, through financial institutions, uh, is is we, you know, the, I, I don't think the country has any kind of a skill set in doing that. Um, also, uh, you know, given the the sort of questions and answers afterwards, as Harun is mentioning, uh, whether from the boards or whether from other uh, institutions, uh, would be very difficult to answer. So the best way to do it is to. Uh, you know, when it's low and we have storages, we, we buy cheaper product and use that. So, so probably a physical hedge would be better than, uh, you know, financial hedge. Okay, Harun, you've been identified in this question also. When will Shell Pakistan introduce environment-friendly Euro 5 fuel and how it will impact your current infrastructure? Sir, we already... Euro friend, uh, environmental friendly Euro 5 mm -hmm. fuel. Uh, local fuels, obviously, is the specification produced by the refineries. It doesn't really impact our infrastructure very much because we uh, kind of uh, mix what we get and bring it to the customers. Uh, currently, what Shell, PSO, mm -hmm. and everyone else is importing 
is making a difference. Uh, is that enough for the environment, for uh, everything else that needs to happen? Not really, but it's a great step forward. So this time I give you a simpler answer. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Adil Saab, uh, I'll let you uh, handle this question from Imran Zafar. Is there going to be a resurgence in the oil industry somewhere down the line? Or is there going to be a major shift to electrical, uh, I think, uh, cars which may kill the oil demand worldwide. If the market for oil goes down, then the entire Gulf region almost becomes bankrupt. So it gives me a feeling that Imran works in the Gulf somewhere. But uh, anyway, <laughs> let's, let's hear you out. <clears throat> yes, Mayor, I think we have already given our opinion I think, on the panelists on this issue, like how long it's going to take. I think... Uh, Mera or it was Shaya, the first think... poll question. The first question was poll. Ka... Yeah. Usme aya tha ke kitne time period mein recover hoga. But uh, now yes. Imran Zafar wants no, a panelist are, opinion. Yeah. There, there are two aspects to us. Ek to after post COVID, the normal demand kab aayegi? To wo to you know the the majority who had responded to your opinion poll was like a year or so. Mm -hmm. So I would tend to agree with that. But the other part is like electric vehicles ki baat hai. So there, I think it's going to take quite some time in at least in Pakistan, maybe 15 years plus, to totally displace fossil fuels. This is going to take longer, maybe 15, 20, or maybe even more. So I don't know whether I've answered this question or not. Uh, uh, Shariar, can you address the next one from uh, Naveed Arshad? Presently, most of the technology in Pakistan <clears throat> is imported. How much risk the OMCs are willing to put in indigenous research and development for creating a new technology driven energy company? Um, I think that what we have to recognize is that the industry, the particular industry we are in is basically a commodity. So we are primarily distributors of a, of a relatively inelastic commodity. Um, in terms of uh, bringing technology in, for, particularly in the downstream area, uh, I think the technology can help uh, improve a lot of our processes and bring efficiencies internally into the, uh, uh, within the OMCs. Um, at this point, I mean, even if I look at developed markets, uh, for the average consumer, uh, the, the impact of technology in the petroleum sector you know when i go to a gas station here in canada to fill up the experience pretty much is the same as when i go to pakistan or anywhere to fill up there's there's really no difference i mean other than the fact that i have to fill it up here myself and there somebody fills it up for me so um i i know that there are some innovations in the filling that is now you know a company in in one of the um, Scandinavian countries where they've introduced this automatic nozzle where you drive up and through the app, the, you know, it'll fill your, your tank. But uh, in terms of any game-changing technology in this sector, I, I don't know whether there's, there's anything significant anywhere in the world uh, that would be some kind of a step change. So again, in a, in a developing country like Pakistan with the kind of margin structures we have, I don't think the OMCs or, or even the refineries uh, would be able to invest um, you know, any significant amounts in research and development. Uh, Excellent. In yeah. East in the short term. yeah, you have a point there. So, uh, Mr. Adil Khattak, the next question is for you. So can, oh. I, can, I, can I add a sentence yeah. or two to the Yeah, question? sure. Sure, sure. Please. Our industry runs a very real danger producing the future steel mills. Future what? Steel mill of Pakistan. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it runs the danger of producing skeletons that will be a liability. And the only way around it is to invest in technology to understand that there is a energy transition going on in the world. To constantly ask ourselves, how do we play the energy transition? Realizing that the transition may well not be driven by Pakistan. Lekin Pakistan ne gaadi invent nahi ki thi, magar gaadi idhar chalti hai. Pakistan never invented motorcycle, magar idhar motorcycle chalta hai. Pakistan ne solar technology mein ek rupiah nahi kharcha hua. 
लेकिन इधर सोलूशन है हमारी इंडस्ट्री में ट्रांजिशन आ रहा है इट इज देयर For every single company in this country who is operating in this industry, that's the existential question we need to ask ourselves: What is our role in the transition? Because sooner or later it will hit us. Technology will change things. PTCL, when I was growing up, used to be the most profitable department of the government of Pakistan. Today there are problems. Yeah. So you know, so, we need to. It's an existential question that you asked us. Answer क्या है यहाँ में नहीं पता. But to say के इसको हम ignore कर देंगे और कुछ नहीं होगा is naive. Yeah, like for example, motorcycle is like fifty percent or fifty percent plus of your customers now in the gasoline area. And motorcycles, yeah. if you look at in China, are almost all on battery. Electric. so if motorcycles convert on battery then it's a major business uh, risk that the omcs have if they convert into battery so, and the refineries have and the industry has and yeah. it's also a fabulous opportunity because yeah. the world is full of exciting new ideas you have to play the change yeah. exactly ignoring the change is the problem mm -hmm. so adil khatak saab the next one is for you about the furnace oil you very briefly mentioned about furnace oil yeah. and what the refineries are planning to do so the gentleman abdullah umar wants to know in this coming winter what do you plan to do yeah i think it's a very relevant uh, question and as i mentioned it is a big challenge to the refineries as well you see what happens in pakistan is that in in summers the electricity demand crosses i mean this is uh, in addition to karachi if you leave out karachi in the national grid it goes it crosses 22000 megawatt in winters it comes down to almost 7 7000 megawatt so there's a big seasonal variation and major consumer of furnace oil in pakistan is and used to be at least the power plants which was running on furnace oil so when the government decided to shut down furnace oil or reduce production on furnace oil of electricity this challenge was uh, we we are facing this challenge since for the last 3 years almost so what would we do in winters again you know like only 2 3 months back there was so such a huge demand for furnace oil that it had to be imported as an emergency measure in spite of the previous ban by the government on import of furnace oil so what options we have till such time that we upgrade our refineries or we set up a joint hydro breaker unit what we requested the government was that these for some interim period they should allow the most efficient power plants or furnace oil to continue running because our production is total combined production is about 10000 tons per day so that in terms of megawatt means about 1500 megawatt so if the government could have allowed power plants up to 1500 megawatt in the most efficient ones on the top of the merit list they would have taken care of the furnace oil production of all the refineries combined so to such them they don't do it the option we are left with either to reduce our throughput to minimize our furnace oil production or maybe some refineries can manage to export uh, furnace oil but that would be at a loss because again even the furnace oil being used on shipping ships is now uh, they are required to keep it uh, the sulfur content much lower than it used to be so it is a big challenge yeah <clears throat> right fawad let's move on uh fawad this question is more for the power sector so we can uh, address it when we go to the power sector uh, uh, webinar in the in the future now this one says the government has allowed the adjustment of exchange losses and inventory losses in petroleum product prices specifically in ex refinery prices what is the mechanism for this adjustment does it mean that omcs and refineries will not have any exchange and inventory losses going forward now uh, harun would you like to address this so this is a double edged sword you will also not have any exchange gain yeah so in the past there have been times when the rupee has also gained yeah so you know I, omcs are allowed a very very small margin 2 rupees 80 pesos to be precise you know add in a 5 rupee loss and you have taken over two months of three months of margin so it's it's a very important thing the government has allowed 
and it does mean that uh, gain and loss will be priced out. The other question was on the uh, mechanism, which is, I think, if you have incurred an the inventory mechanism. loss in this month, you will add it as a cost we'll to the other month. Yes, the you next will get month. it cost to the perhaps even month after next when the cargoes are set. Actual actual uh, payments are done and it's auditable and the papers are available, so you get the adjustment. Then, then you will get it. Yeah. <clears throat> Yes, but sir. also so, uh, to the other point in this, um, uh, the inventory losses have not been allowed by the government. Only the exchange loss. So the question yeah. has two points. So no inventory losses have been allowed. So the, the companies will continue to bear those. Yeah. Yeah, inventory losses naturally. I don't think the government can help you out yeah. over there. You have to manage exactly. your inventory yourselves. Uh, and in fairness, you get the inventory gain also. So look, you gain some, you lose some. Exactly, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's part of life. That is risk we sign up to as oil marketing companies or as refineries. I think the key is if you want reasonable environmental standards, if you want a reasonable standard of operation in your country, uh, what is it that, uh, you know, needs to be allowed as a margin? And I think the key there really is complete open market, but with extremely stringent standards. Standards that are properly enforced, understood, laws that are understood, one window operation for the industry, and very, very strong implementation from the regulator. That is the key. Mm -hmm. And the, then if you have a complete open market, you can control price through pre-SO. You can control price through 10 other means, but then you will get your the right standard in the lowest possible cost. And that's very important. Mm -hmm. The next one is from Mr. Alauddin Ahmed Khan uh, regarding the quality of motor gasoline. He thinks it's not as good as what we get in Europe. Is it true? That's the question. So since it's a quality related question and uh, Adil Saab, you produce gasoline. So how yeah. do you uh, comment on this? Uh, okay. More, as far as motor gasoline is concerned, actually the situation is not that bad as it is conceived. The perception is that probably only I think a few weeks back, the HDIP was asked to check the sulfur content in the motor gasoline produced by the local refineries. And the pleasant and surprising news for most were that we were already meeting Euro 5 requirement of sulfur content in motor gasoline. The only point which needs uh, improvement is the addition of additives to improve our RON. Now, talking of RON, the current country requirement is 92 RON for imports. Actually, even Euro 5 requires the minimum is 91 RON. So to improve RON, currently the refineries are adding some additives, some metallic and some non-metallic additives. So we have to take care of that. And for that, as I mentioned earlier, we have to upgrade uh, our, some or add some of our plants to enable us to produce a better quality of motor gasoline. So it's going to take some time. But as far as sulfur content, which is most harmful for, for human, uh, not that bad, I would say. Thank you. Okay, uh, Harun, a question for you that uh, regarding the recent uh, change in price policy from month to fortnightly, considering the longer lead time required for refined oil import, how can OMCs manage and sustain with this new policy? OMCs can, you know, so let me, let me put it the other way around. What does this do? What it does is the following. For the refineries, it makes it slightly more predictable in terms of their production schedule slightly because you know end of the day you know rather than the price changing after 30 days it's changing after 15 but it makes it slightly easier for the refiners mm -hmm. for the omcs you know slightly better in terms of managing the risk because it's a very volatile market and you will see increased volatility in crude prices mm -hmm. when you kept it at a month at the same price and in the middle of the month, the price fell, you know, smuggled product started to seep in. You can keep that comment off the record, by the way. Uh, but, you know, therefore for the OMCs, it makes it slightly better. 
does it make it far more profitable or far less profitable? Actually not. It just makes it more stable. And that stability will help our industry. Therefore, I'm a huge proponent of this. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, does it make it far more risky? No, it makes it more predictable. Okay, Ogra has the requirement to maintain 20 days of storage of petroleum product. Does this requirement, in essence, uh, do we need to increase the requirement further? What are the storage days requirement in the region? So, uh, any any views? I think Harun, you should uh, continue. You should answer about the region. What's happening in the in the vicinity, and then we can uh, take the first half from Sharia. In the vicinity, there are hardly any such requirements. There's Companies no are required to keep their pumps wet. Laws are simple. We also, by the way, need to simplify our laws. Mm -hmm. Your the future you're looking at is a world clearly where you know, products and refined products are in surplus. Europe is going to see the highest, or it's predicted, uh, predicted is the right word because no one can say for sure, it is predicted to have a relatively higher refining surplus. Mm -hmm. Many other projects are announced in construction. On the other hand, COVID has reduced demand, but also demand is not seen by most analysts to grow at the pace you would you were seeing in the uh, 2010s. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a decade change, there's a decade shift. And what does that mean? That means product availability is not going to be a huge challenge. You just need to allow a reasonable framework uh, for companies to price out the cost at which they're buying it and focus there rather than focusing on reserves. I would rather 20 days is fine. It's, it's a good number, as good as any. Uh, if strategic reserves are needed, that is a separate debate and for the government uh, and, uh, you know, or, or, or companies can be paid to build them and they will build them. Uh, what is key is to realize we need as a country a much cleaner environment. We desperately need it. Costs are very high. We need good implementation structures. We need good governance. And we need to be able to implement all of that uh, through our government in a reasonable way. Back to yourself, sir. Excellent. Fawad has uh, interestingly the same question in the poll. So if I recall right, Fawad. <laughs> so why don't you have your poll question, the last one. Last poll question, please. Uh, what level of strategic oil reserves should be kept by Pakistan? All participants are requested to please spawn uh, just before we move towards the closing uh, for everyone that uh, uh, any questions that we have not answered we will be preparing a post webinar paper we will be capturing the comments of the learned speakers and also try to answer other questions which were left unanswered uh, i think just if i may make a comment uh, yakub on the 20 yeah. days yeah. I think the 20 days uh, requirement is driven by two things. One is the uh, is to encourage investment in infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, by uh, you know the oil marketing companies uh, and the refineries, I suppose. Uh, the second is obviously security of, of supply in the country because we are import dependent uh, and because of all the geopolitical situation in the region. Uh, the the 20 days is a is is this requirement for, uh, you know, energy security as well. So I, I think, you know, well, I agree with Harun that there's no right answer whether it should be 20 or 10 or whatever. <clears throat> I, I think that the two driving factors for the 20 days uh, were these, um, these, these two considerations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, uh, uh, Shariar. And I know the amount of uh, pressure the oil marketing companies go through because it's monitored uh, very closely as to who's keeping what level of uh, inventory by uh, by Ogra. So good luck on that. And uh, I think now we'll have to come to the close of our uh, session. And uh, just to uh, recap, I think we touched upon almost everything that's connected to the OMCs and the refinery. And uh, in brief, of course, because you need uh, 
many many hours to understand this complex business that uh, Harun Sharyar and uh, Adil Sahab manage and uh, i know the amount of tension and sleepless nights uh, it takes to uh, work in this industry so that people comfortably get uh, fuel all across the country now uh, the pricing yes we touched pricing it was a major issue for the oil marketing companies the announcement of price the frequency because of the major uh, uh, inventory losses uh, because of pricing that the industry was facing so i think that was a good step that was taken for uh, a fortnightly pricing uh, adil saab's comments were uh, well taken uh, regarding the major investments required and a lot of support required from the government to run the base business refineries in pakistan are currently really struggling to run the existing refinery what to talk of uh, you know investing into the future and getting uh, more uh, capacity increases and technology changes which is very desperately required by pakistan omcs have their challenges naturally the uh, covid situation really taught all the omcs a very very major lesson and i'm sure a lot of discussions are going on so most of the things were touched upon hedging yeah there are issues over there it's not that simple you if you go wrong and you are a public sector you start getting call up notices very quickly so uh, people have to uh, operate between you know uh, a very thin line so my big thank you to all the three speakers and the organizers and now it's over to you uh, i think khalid rahman uh, you would now take it up so it's 556 <coughs> Uh, thank you very much yakub i'm glad that uh, you mentioned 556 we have four minutes to go <laughs> that make my life very easy yeah. just so just saying a uh, simple thank you to all of you uh, but i would not leave you so uh, yeah, yeah. i will not let you you can take your four scot- minutes <laughs> scot free so i will add in one more minute if yeah. you allow uh, so thank you very much yakub um, assalam alaikum ladies and gentlemen a very good evening and thank you for your participation today i firstly found the discussions to be highly informative and i'm certain that the viewers uh, have also benefited from the discourse of the industry leaders in the oil marketing and refinery sector uh, it's a complex sub- subject and some of the things i could not understand having worked in the oil and gas industry for uh, for the last uh, 30 years uh, uh, so i can understand that we need to have uh, a more sort of um, detailed analysis of some of the topics that we had discussed which were highly enlightening and in very very um, uh, informative and i agree uh, with the view of our panelists uh, that oil is nowhere uh, going out um, i mean and i think it's uh, and i fully agree with the comment from uh, sharia that uh, i think next uh, 30 40 years i think we can easily survive as omcs and oil refining uh, 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 companies so at the outset i would like to record my deepest gratitude to our panel members haru rashid um, adil khatak and sharia umar sharia thank you very much for joining us from toronto in the early hours and for sharing uh, the valuable insights i'm extremely grateful to yakub sattar um, a past president and a veteran of oil industry for moderating today's session and for putting the whole webinar together thank you yakub once again um the pib uh, the professional accountants of business committee of icap has been hosting a series of webinars and this is the this was the 12th webinar in the serial we have covered oil and gas healthcare and pharmaceutical financial services power sector um fmcg and textiles and today was oil marketing and refining uh, refining hopefully going forward we'll be introducing other um uh, business sector uh, webinars uh, but for the time being uh, we've decided to give it a short break um the webinars were initiated to review the impact of covid-19 on different business sectors and how the challenges are being addressed one thing has emerged clearly that digital transformation and innovation has become critical for business survival 
while leadership, resilience, and focus on human resources are the key drivers to meet the challenges such as face with COVID-19. At ICAP, uh, we, had, uh, we have a very highly committed team of volunteers from the PIB committee, duly supported by ICAP staff who have been organizing these webinars. I would particularly like to thank Fahad Aftab, um, who has been a very active member of our webinar uh, task force, uh, and who was also the host of today's webinar. Also, uh, other uh, PIB members who did you, you did not see, but were hiding behind um, uh, closed cameras, uh, who have put in a lot of work, um, are uh, Mohammed Humair, Rauf Jan, Khalid Noor, Murtaza Feroz, Mohammed Shweb, Naim Ghori, Abdul Qadir, <coughs> and also ICAP staff, Ambar Anwar, um, Imran Hafiz, Adnan Usmani, Arsalan Rabbani, and Shanawaz Abro. I'm thankful to all of them for the dedicated efforts and, and for making this web webinar serial a success. Now, briefly about the PIB committee of ICAP. This committee exists to serve our membership working in business industry, which is around 80% of the total membership of ICAP. The basic idea is to create a platform for the continuous training and development. And I'm extremely thankful to Yakub. Uh, Yakub, um, we have your presence. So, um, I would like to acknowledge that that's all his brainchild. He, he initiated it and uh, we are just taking it forward. So Yakub and Khalil are um, the two um, you know, who have put in a lot of work. So I'm, I'm, grateful, I'm grateful to all, to both of them uh, to have set up this forum, uh, which is uh, working with an extremely dedicated and committed um, members of the PIB committee. Uh, the PIB committee has taken a number of initiatives, holding, um, including holding of CFO conferences. Uh, this is a flagship, flagship program of uh, the PIB committee. Uh, we, the, it's, a, it's a yearly event with participation of over uh, 2,000, 2,000 to 3,000 um, uh, 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 audience. And it's, it's, a, it's a major event, which is held at two, two locations, um, Karachi and uh, one in North. And uh, we look forward to our support from uh, the industrial leaders um, to not only come forward in terms of speaking, but also in terms of sponsorships going forward. Uh, we have um, a National Finance Olympiad uh, to test the skills and knowledge of our uh, members. And it's a, it's a very, very tough, um, uh, competition. It's supported. Uh, 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 it is. It is uh, co-sponsored by Unilever. So we have a very active uh, industry pastor who is helping us in terms of building up a knowledge base amongst our uh, members. Um, to conclude, I would like to thank uh, President Ika Khalila Sheikh and the council members for the guidance, support, and, and encouragement. May Allah bless you all and keep you safe and healthy. Good night and Allah Hafiz. Pakistan, Zindabad. Pakistan, Pahindabad. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.